one, two. There it is. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Praise the Lord. There you go. Come on, bless those hands. Let's bless the Lord together. Listen, let's go ahead right into worship. There's a song that says, you're amazing. And we're talking about God. So the song says this, you're amazing, you're amazing, you're amazing, you're amazing, you're amazing, you're amazing, so amazing, so amazing. And then there's the lead, and then um, it goes right back into you're amazing, just like that. Y'all ready to try? All right, everybody to your feet real quick. Come on, stretch it out. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I came on purpose to worship God. So let's worship him. Come on, clap your hands right there. That's it. Woo! You're amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. So amazing. So amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. So amazing. You cause the sun, the sun, the moon to shine. I'm so glad you're mine. Oh, I'm glad to say you're mine. You came in all of you, amazed at everything you do. Your holy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain for me. We stand in all of you, amazed. And everything he does, somebody say, you're holy, worthy is the lamb who was slain for me. Now everybody, put your hands together, no one compares to you, say no one compares, I can search the world and find no one. Come on, here's our part right here. Come on, lift it. Say, you're amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. Say, no. No one compares to you. No one could even come close to you. I can search the world and find nobody like Jesus. Come on, let's lift it up high. Say, you're amazing. You're amazing. Say you're amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. And everything you do. Shout you're amazing. God, you are amazing. Each and every day of our lives. You are amazing. You are amazing. Let's tell the story of Jesus. If he's amazing in your life. Let's tell the story of Jesus. If you know he's great, if you know that he's amazing, come on, put your hands together. If you know we serve a mighty God, if you know we serve an awesome God, here it is. Jesus went, he went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me. They hung him high. On an old rugged cross for you and me, he shared his blood. Now that's amazing. Now that's amazing. He redeemed us from the enemy. He redeemed us from sin. Anybody grateful for this amazing grace? Now that's amazing. That's amazing. But I'm glad he did. He didn't have to die for you and me. But I'm glad he did. He woke us up this morning. Gave us strength in our bodies. Gave us clapping in our hands. Gave us a voice to shout. Now that's amazing. Now that's amazing. You can see me. And I could see. 
see you. Yeah, that's amazing. Now that's amazing. Now that's amazing. Come on, lift it up. That's amazing. Say you're amazing. Come on, bless God right there. Is he amazing to you this morning? It's another song here. It's an older song. It says Amazing Grace. Do anybody know that one right there? Let's try that one together because he's an amazing God this morning. He's so amazing. So amazing. So amazing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, hands are lifted all over the house. We know we serve an amazing God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Come on. That same a wretch like me. Hallelujah. I once was lost, but now I thank you, Jesus. Was blind. dangers through many days church toss girls toss, and stairs I have I have already already come become how precious it is how precious it that grace appears of the hour the I, I first believe, I first believe. Everybody could sing this together. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Come on, do you feel his presence? Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Come on, we came to praise him. Praise God, hallelujah, praise. Come on, one more time, let's lift that up to heaven. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Praise God, praise God, praise God. From the mountaintop, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Come on, if he's amazing right there, hands are lifted, hands are lifted, and mouths are filled with praise. Father, we honor you this morning. Father, we thank you this morning for being amazing to us, God. We thank you for loving us, God. We thank you for slaying the enemy and stopping the enemy in his tracks. Father, we thank you that this year will be a great year for so many of us. In our health, God, increasing our faith, God, we thank you on today, God, that you are doing something great in the earth through our church, through our community, through us, God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody shout amen. 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 We got one more song in worship, guys. Y'all excited about it? Yes, 
All right. Now listen, this song here is going to stretch you a little bit, but you're going to catch it. I know you're going to catch it. Now push your neighbor this time. Push him. Push him. Give him a little nudge. Push him. You can push him. She's like, don't you push me. <laughs> push him. Push him. And to, uh, this song, it says, um, happy. I'm happy. Now, um, I know what song y'all thought about. Grab a long gift you feel like a, no, not that one, all right? But this song also just describes that we're happy about that amazing grace we sung about. We're happy about it. And so the song says, um, uh, you make me happy. You make me whole. You take the pain away. I'm so in love with you. Y'all can try that out with me. Let's try. You make me happy. You make me whole. You take the pain away. I'm so in love with you. That's it. And then it says, and everything about you is right. Covers all my wrong. Your life saved my life. Everybody got it? Let's try. And everything about you is right. Covers all my wrong. Covers all my wrong. Your life saved my life. And then it says, it, where you is where I belong. I'm in, I'm a, I'm, I belong to you, God. I belong to you, God. And then that's a whole song there. And then we got some background tracks. They're going to help us out. How that sound? Clap your hands right there if you love Jesus. Let's go with happy. Let's go. It's fast now, so you got to move a little bit, okay? Come on. Clap right there, everybody. That's it. Come on. We came to worship an awesome and a mighty God. If you're watching online, go ahead and share this. You make me happy. You make me whole. You take the pain away. I'm so in love with you. You make me happy. You make me whole. You take the pain away. I'm so in love with you. You make me happy. Come on. You make me. You. You take the. Come on, everybody. You make me. That's it. You make me. You take, you take the pain away. I'm so. And everything about you, and everything about you is right. Covers all, covers all my wrong. Your life saved my life. And everything about you, everything about you is right. Covers all my wrong. Your life saved my life. You is where I belong. I belong to you, Lord. I belong to you, Lord. Everybody, I belong to you, Lord. I'm so in love with you. Can't make it without you. I live to worship you. Uh, forever me and you. I'm so in love with you. Can't make it without you. I live to worship you. Forever me and help me say, I'm so in love with you. Can't make it without you. I live to worship you. Forever me and you. And everything about you is right. Covers all my wrong. Your life saved my life. And everything about you, everything about you is right. Covers all my wrong. Your life saved my life. You is where I belong. So in love with you. Can't make it without you. I live to worship you. So in love with you, can't make it without you. I live to worship you, forever me and you. Everybody, so in love with you, can't make, can't make it without you. I live, I live to worship you, 
forever me one more time so in love with you can't make it without you i live i live to worship you forever me and you so so in love with you can't make it without you i live i live to worship you forever forever me and one more time so in love with you can't make can't make it without you i live to worship you forever forever me and you why forever because everything about you is that's it it covers all my wrong your life saved my life think about that and everything about you everything about you is covers it covers all my wrong your life saved my life and this is why you is where i belong i belong to you lord i belong to you lord i belong to you lord and everything about you is Now check this out. You know what was really great? To see each of you not be afraid, fearless, and you just went after it in worship. You know what was good? I think about when I first started coming and worshiping and saw how you guys were like, mm, all right. All right, this guy got a lot of energy. Slow it down, slow it down. But to see how you progress week after week, and how God is taking your worship to the next level, another level, greater depths, higher heights. It's amazing to watch. It's amazing to participate in worship with you. So one more time. Everything about you is, point up at heaven right there. It covers all my wrong. Your life saved my life. One more time. Everything, everything about you is right. It what? covers all my wrong your life saved my life and this is what we say in you is where i belong so all this week no matter what you go through just think about that you are where i belong no matter what happens no matter what comes your way with you is where I belong. He said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. That he'll be with us until the end of the ages. With you is where I belong. Sometimes God is more faithful to us all the time. He's more faithful to us than we are to him. So that's why we have to keep reminding ourselves. With you is where I belong. Bless God right there with your hands. One more time. in worship with our giving. I ask for a couple volunteers to come forward and help pass out the baskets. Get one other person. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Let, let, us, let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day, for being with us, allowing us all to be here together to worship you, to praise you, give you glory and give you honor. Lord, I pray for this offering that all that be used for your glory, for your honor and for the good of others. Thank you, dear Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
If you will, please take your Bibles, turn to John chapter 10. Our responsive reading today will be John 10, verses 1 through 10. I'll ask those here to please stand and follow along as I read. Those at home also, please take your Bibles and follow along. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee for him from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech, speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill, kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Thank you. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Again, good morning, everyone. Oh, yeah. Mercy, Jesus. Good morning, everybody. Let me hear your voices. I see your faces. I want to hear your voices. It's good to be here today. What a great opportunity to be alive and well and to come publicly into the presence of God and be with other brothers and sisters for fellowship. So again, I say welcome, welcome, welcome. Go ahead and turn your Bibles into the Gospel of John. I want to, I want to complete chapter 1 today. And um, I want to talk to you this morning about the disciples' witness, and that's going to be the premise of, of what we're going to talk about today, the actual verbal, physical presentation of disciples that represent God and share what they know and understand. And so we'll get a glimpse of that this morning. But just by way of recapping chapter 1, I want you to take a look just for a moment at the very first verse. And he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And he talks about, the writer talks about who God is. And that is how the apostle John works. He wants you to know God. He's going to go into great depth, great detail, sharing just a few specific things technically, but he's going to hone in on that concept of who God is and what difference that makes to you and I and that first century reader. So let's pray about it, and then let's trust God to give us revelation, give us insight, give us accuracy, truth, and meat that we can apply to our lives. Father, I trust you today as always in everything. I'm the one who's standing here in this spot, but I'm the one who's in need. And so I humbly submit myself before you, Father, and I'm asking you, fill me with your spirit. Help me to understand this text and to be able to communicate your truth accurately. Lord, let it be done thoroughly and clearly. And Father, let it have the ability to open up the eyes, the hearts, and the minds of all of us today, that we would come to know you more intimately, that you would draw us in closer to your bosom, and that we would hear your breath, we would feel your strength, we would come to know you, Father, like never before, and give us a hunger to know you more and more for the rest of our days. I pray, O oh God, for what you're doing here today for the presence that we have here in this community and what that means, dear Father, to a world that doesn't have time for you, to a world, dear Father, that doesn't think they need to know you, to a world that feels like if they have money, if they have things, that's enough. And I pray, dear Father, that somebody's eyes be opened 
And I trust you to do those things only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. First 39 verses, we've covered a lot of ground. In those 39 verses of chapter 1, the writer has introduced us to the creator of the universe. Inside of the first 39 verses in John, he has presented the Logos, the word of God, and declared that nothing in this universe or this world that was made was not made without him. And he's declared that in these verses. He is describing not only for Israel, but for the entire world, that one has come into the world by design, and that one that has come into the world has come as the light and the life of all men, all people, everywhere. And he comes with a purpose to explain what God is like. To explain what God does, how he operates. To explain what God, in fact, wants from the very people that inhabit the world, this earth, that God himself created. You would think that everybody would just be flourishing to the Gospel of John. To hear a word that helps give definition and purpose to their life to help people understand why am I here? Why do I exist? Is it just a eight to five job? Is it just a time spent watching TV? Or is it time cutting the grass? Or, or is it time fishing or hunting? What, why do I exist? And John tackles these great things. He has, he's introduced a character. And remember now, <clears throat> our goal is not to become uh, captivated simply by the characters, technically not even the miracles. What we're after here is to hear from the writer and to grasp the message that God is saying. And so John has introduced John the Baptist. And he is declaring that John the Baptist was actually sent into the world to prepare a way for the Messiah, Israel's Savior, the Word of God, the Son of God, to come into the world and to people so they can understand that God, God's about to do a revolutionary thing. There is a spiritual revolution about to erupt, and John the Baptist came to pave the way and ask people to pick up an old idea, an old and ancient concept, all the way back to the Garden of Eden, He's asking them to consider something simple and yet profound. Put your faith in God. Believe in him. Let your faith and your belief be built on a foundation of trust when you say that you believe in God. Because when the difficult days come, when the trying days come, when the testing days come, you'll know what you believe you'll know where you stand. And so the writer is trying to help people to grasp an ancient concept. Really put your faith in God, not in buildings, not in men, not in systems, not in money, not in yourself. Put your faith in God. Believe in him. That is John's theme throughout the gospel. Believe. Simply, simply believe. What stands before us this morning is a, in these verses is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. And he's launching out now past the Jordan, and he's gone through the baptism, and he's been announced and declared, listen, there he is, there. He is the Lamb of God come to take away the sins of the world. And that's kind of where we're at. So let me pick up in verse 35 of chapter 1. I'm going to go back just a few steps before I get into... Uh, the second and the third movement here, I think, are transition points in the passage. But I want to remind you, in verse 35, the writer says this. Again, the next day, and you guys as Bible students know now, when a writer begins to give you times and dates or locations, you want to pay attention. But I'm going to ask you not to, to worry yourself so much about what day it is. Every now and then you look at these passages and say, well, that was yesterday, this is today, this is tomorrow, that's three days. And then how did Jesus get from here to here to here to here? You, you want to, don't get caught up. The writer is telling you about a change or a transition. 
And so he says, and again, the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, John the Baptist now. And he looked upon Jesus as he walked and said, behold, here he is. That's the Lamb of God. Said the same thing in verse 29. Look, there he is. That's the one. He's the one. Here he is, the Lamb of God. And then John the Apostle writes in verse 37, and the two disciples heard him speak. And they followed Jesus. And so before I do anything else, I want to describe for you what I believe this text is offering the reader. And he's offering people an understanding of what it means to be a disciple. Some of us have been going to church a long time. And we still don't understand what God requires of us. The writer simply says there were two disciples standing there as John the Baptist bore witness that the one that's walking and coming, he's the Lamb of God, he's the Messiah, he's the Christ, he's the Savior, he's the one we've been waiting for. And they said, what? Wow. And then they decide to follow Jesus. So I want you to stop for a moment. I want you to think just for a moment about John the Baptist as an example, not just a forerunner, but think about him as an example. In fact, I'm going to ask you to look at John the Baptist like a model and to consider him himself as a disciple, a believer, somebody who's looking for that one. And when he finds him, he specifically does things. He points people to him. In the first century, when a teacher would have a group of disciples that followed him and they would listen to him and they would observe him and they would talk to him and he would teach them and help them to grow spiritually, they kind of clung to him and held on to him. John simply says, that's the guy. You know what that looks like to me in terms of discipleship? Humility. It looks like confidence such strong confidence that I'm not worrying that people who've been following me now start following someone greater than me. And he points them toward Jesus, and he releases them, and they follow. Verse 37 simply says, they follow. Sometimes in this world, men, leaders, people want to make a name for themselves. And they start off really good in one way, but power has a way sometimes of corrupting. And men tend to build reputations, and they try to build monuments, and they want to be remembered. And so they create narratives or they create scenarios where their name can live on. John said, there he is. They said, what? They followed, and John let them go. John the Baptist's reputation, John the Baptist's group or following wasn't his primary goal. In fact, he, he lets them go. I see him a little bit differently, if you just kind of let me walk through this. I see John in terms of thinking about him as a model, not only of a disciple, but as a servant. What would church look like if it's filled full of servant leaders? Not a church filled with pastors. Where, and just let me, can I get in trouble for a minute? Let, let me get into trouble, Ken. You can back me up. Don't let me hang. Don't let me hang, brother. What would it look like if the church was just filled with pastors? Instead of the pews being there, all the seats were right here. They're waiting on one to get through so they can pontificate. What would it look like? If the church was just full of big eyes and big U's. In this context, John the Baptist is the greatest of them all. But he's, he's what we would call a servant leader. And so he has no problem with Christ coming on the scene and recognizing someone greater than I who existed before I did. I need to yield. I need to submit. I need to accomplish what God sent me in the world to do, to point people toward Jesus. Can you hear that? 
If you were to turn your Bible to chapter 3 and verse 30, you would hear John the Baptist say this, these words. I must decrease so that Jesus, he can increase. What kind of church is that where we're, always, we're more interested in the welfare of others than we are ourselves? What kind of fellowship is that when we care about one another deeply and, and, and honestly and in a holy manner and we're interested in the welfare of others? And you take the time to make sure people know Christ and you point them to him. You point them to him. They call him, those disciples in verse 38, they call Jesus, they call him rabbi. Jesus sees them following. And he asks them, listen, fellas, what do you want? What are you after? What are you looking for? They just simply want to know. And it's, it's simple stuff, but it's just so deep to me. They, they ask him, where are you staying at, Jesus? Do you do that when you go to the store and witness to people? You stand there at the line getting ready to check out and you ask, man, where you live? What's your address? I need your social security number. <laughs> Come on, Miss Joanne. They ask him, you know, where you staying, Jesus? He just tells them, listen, listen and I'm going to get to the point, the, the bigger point here. He just tells them in verse 39, he says, Come and see. Follow me. C Come on. I'm headed somewhere. Come, come follow me. And I want, you, I, want you, I want you to hear what they said in verse 39. I'm in, and this is what I see disciples meaning and, and the value of being a real disciple, of being a servant of God, of being a servant leader. They just simply say, he asked them, come and see. And then the writer says, they came therefore and they saw. They came, they took his, his opportunity to follow him. They took it. And then they saw where he was staying. And then the writer documents it. He says, and they stayed. They stayed that day. They stayed right there. He documents the time. It's about the 10th hour. And in my understanding, it's not too late that they can't go home. It's earlier in the day, in the 10th hour. It's earlier in the day, not late at night. They could have got home, but they stayed. This is a theme that John is building on. What does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? John in chapter 15 is going to go into great depth about what that means. If you're a disciple, if you're a follower, if you're a servant leader, you abide in Christ. You find out where he's at and you follow him. And then you see where he stays and then you stay with him. God, help me to do this today. What is a real disciple? Someone who stays with Christ. Someone who identifies him for who he is. Those that are in leadership are not ashamed or afraid or insecure to point others to Christ. Actually, we're praying for that. I want you to see him. I want you to know him. I want you to find out where he's staying, take a good look, and then stay right there. Stay right there. They call him rabbi, teacher. It's a term of honor. It's a term of respect. They later on in verse 41 call him Messiah. That is an Arabic form there of a word, an eschatological form. It's about the idea that someone is coming one day who's going to render us hey, aid and help. There's something and someone coming that will get us out of this quagmire. There's someone coming who's stronger than the Roman Empire, who's stronger than the economy, stronger than drought, stronger than famine. There's someone coming. And they say, we found out where he's staying we went and looked we saw we stayed with him we don't want to go anywhere else wherever he's at and they call him messiah there's another term related to that that anointed one 
the Christ. When you find him, you want to be as closely connected and intimate with him as you can. Good disciples draw closer. And so I see John here as this, and let me summarize the idea. The idea that I see of John the Baptist is, is that he's a great leader. He's a servant leader. He is someone who understands who Christ is, and he himself has now connected. And he's encouraging others to know him, to abide in him, to have faith in him. You know what comes along with that? George, fruit comes along with that. Spiritual growth, spiritual development, transformation. It's not simply about going to church or showing up and attending. It's about experiencing a God that has the power, has the ability, has the will to transform every life. And to accomplish something magnificent in every life. And every servant leader ought to be hungry to see people experience that transformation possibility. And so in verse 43, we'll kind of try to come to the end in this, this transitional thought here in verse 23. The writer says again, the next day. He purposed to go forth into Galilee, and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, listen, follow me. It's an interesting thing. It's, it's just a change in setting now. It's just a transitional change in setting here. And here in this, this segment here, <clears throat> the biggest focus is on Nathaniel. But in this context here, he says that uh, Jesus found Philip. He finds Philip. He asked him, the teacher asked the potential disciple, I want you to follow me. That was not heard of, Bobby. All the people who wanted to be disciples would hunt down a teacher, follow him, stick with him, beg him, plead him. You need to catch this. Jesus finds him and then invites him. God is more interested in you than you have ever been in him. It's an important point to catch. So what kind of, I think you, you want to remember, you want to just, Embed this thought in your mind. What kind of faith does it take? What kind of belief is involved to see people's lives transformed as you watch these men who are busy making their livings, taking care of their families, doing their daily routine, and then somebody comes into their life and says, listen, follow me. And everything in their world is turned upside down. Everything is shaken. Everything has changed. Now, here's, here's, a, here's a thought. Go back to verse 40 for a second, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to establish it. One of the two, again, one of the two who heard John speak, talking about John the Baptist speak, and followed him was Andrew. That's Peter's brother. Now, listen, listen to what he says <clears throat> in verse 45. Once Philip gets in the picture, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found him. Now, Jesus found Philip. Andrew got his brother. Now, Philip is running around telling people, we found him. We found him. I want to ask you to consider something. Who found who? You need to ask yourself. These may sound like simple things but you need because there are people running around telling people you know, I found Jesus 10 years ago man help me to do this now. help me help me Lord I don't want to be sarcastic but this stuff is funny to me I didn't find Jesus and I'm going to tell you today I don't believe you did either you want to know why he's never been lost who was the one that needed to be found is the one that was lost Some of the ones that were lost were going to synagogue every week. Some of the ones that were lost were a part of the covenant nation, nation of Israel. They were lost. He came looking for them. They, they describe what they found in verse 45. We found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets, the one that they wrote about. We found Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. We found him. 
Listen to the text. They say they found the one that Moses talked about. Moses, pro Moses prophesied that one day there's going to come a prophet into Israel like me. Look for him. And when he comes, listen to him. He was talking prophetically about a Messiah, a Savior coming in the far, far future. The prophets in the Old Testament prophesied and wrote, they wrote about a coming Messiah, a coming Savior that would deliver Israel. And so these things are documented. They are written. They are a part of the Old Testament text. And if you guys don't remember when John chapter 1, when he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, he's talking about the Word that not only spoke, but the written Word that was written. And it's all written about him so who found who? In the fullness of time, the Son of God left heaven and became a man. And that is what the writer is trying to communicate. In the fullness of time, God kept his word. And his word that was written was bearing witness about him for hundreds of years. And it's a great thing to be a witness for Christ. But I want to ask you to consider something. Before you start talking to people about God, you ought to start talking to God first. And maybe we ought to start listening to him and hear from him. Hear from him. So the word that made the world stands before them. And the written word that's embodied in the flesh is now witnessing before them. Here he is, the Son of God. Here is the Lamb of God. Let's try to get out. Let's try to, try to exit out. Nathaniel asked, I think, a, a great question because he's dealing with his own world. And in his mind, you don't go down, you just don't go down there to... Uh, Nazareth, that's like the wrong side of the tracks. If you go down there, you don't go down there at night. Be with me today, Lord. <laughs> Y'all not going to work with me this morning. Y'all too still. Come on. This, dude, Nazareth wasn't necessarily a great place. So Nathaniel asked the right question. Man, listen, can anything good come out of there, man? That's the low end of the budget. And I'm telling you, there are things that people understand that they don't understand. So the writer begins in verse 47. He says, Jesus saw Nathaniel. Now, Philip already witnessed to him. But verse 47 says, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. And Nathaniel, verse 48, wants to know, how do you know me? I just heard about you the other day. How do you know me? Alyssa, I want you to think about this with me. See, there's sometimes, there's sometimes in our life, we lose sight of the fact that who God really is. When we're going through hard times, difficult times, we tend to focus on the things in front of us, the things that hurt us, the things that worry us, and we lose sight of who God is. And Nathaniel said, I just heard about you. How do you know about me? And that's the great thing about God. He knows everything about everybody all at the same time. He didn't need an introduction. And when you get to know him, your problems may not be as big as they seem. I want you all to hold on to that with me today. So we have some challenges that we're facing during these times. The writer calls him an authentic Israelite. Says that Jesus said that Nathaniel, he was, he was just an authentic, genuine Israelite. Had no guile in his mouth. He was a straight up honest guy. And Jesus says, I know you for who and what you are. I want you to let me run with this. Let me, let me illustrate this concept uh, in my mind. 
Nathaniel realized that supernaturally God knows us without an introduction. He knows us. He knows us all. Nathaniel, like most of the Israelites, knew their own history, knew the patriarchs of their faith and their culture. So Nathaniel, like most of Israel, knew about Jacob. And Jacob got his blessing from God by cheating, by deceit, by trickery. He becomes a patriarch. He steals the birthright through deception of his older brother, but he steals it through deceit, and he becomes the patriarch of the family, and his name is written in the annals of Israeli history. But God knows who you are, what you do, why you do what you do, when we do what we do, and why. He says, Nathaniel is an authentic believer and Israelite but there are other people around who are authentically corrupt man if that was your boy Jacob I want you to just go with me for a second because God loved them both God had a plan to cover the sin of humanity and to draw all people unto himself sometimes people are thinking oh, I'm just not good enough just can't. If I walk through the doors of the church, you know the roof will probably cave in. People feel like that sometimes. People feel like, you know, I can't go through there. Everybody in there is just holy. And I'm not. So they don't go. They don't come. They don't feel comfortable. They don't know the God. Who knows the hearts, the minds, and the soul of every human being? They don't know the God who came to live and to die for their salvation, their deliverance, who willingly calls everyone unto himself. Why, why is that valuable, Pastor? Why would you even introduce a guy like Jacob in here and just use him as an illustration? Because with Jacob and all of his treachery, deception, and theft... God had a plan and a desire and a will to transform his life. And everyone that comes across him, that is the objective. God wants to change and transform every life. That is the goal of Christianity, that every believer would become Christ-like. That's what he calls us to. And even with a Jacob... Not only did he want to transform him, he wanted to transform the nation that comes forth out of him. He wanted to accomplish the supernatural. So Nathaniel, I knew you before you, your mom and dad knew you. I knew you while you were under the tree praying. I know what you said. I know what you asked for. I know what's in your heart. And I know what you need. I know what you need. So God takes a Jacob. The angel of God comes down and wrestles with him. He hits him in the hip and dislocates his hip. And Jacob holds on for dear life because now he realizes, I'm in a fight with God. I can't win. And maybe if I hold on, just hold on, he'll ask me what Jesus asked these men. What do you want? What do you want? And he changed Jacob's life, changed his name, changed his status. And that is exactly what John the Baptist and John the writer are talking about. In verse 50 or verse 49. Once Nathaniel understands who he's talking to, he answers Jesus and says, Rabbi, teacher, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? Now, can I, I'm, I'm going to exit. I'm going to get out of this real quick. Of course, preachers say that all the time and keep going for another hour. 
but I'm going to try to get out of this real quick. Do you see what he asked him? He asked him here, do you believe? He didn't ask him about all his family history. He didn't ask him about how many times he sinned. He didn't ask him what he did yesterday or what he was thinking about doing tomorrow. He didn't ask him about the burden on his life or the thoughts of failure or even the, the ideas of success. He didn't ask him about those things. He asked him, do you believe? He didn't even tell him, listen, I need you to repent right now. I need you to repent of everything. Think of 50 things, make a list, and repent. He didn't do that. He asked him, do you believe? Because if you believe, he says, you're going to see greater things than this. I simply told you something about yourself that was impossible for anybody to know unless they were God. But that's a minimal thing. And you're about to see greater things. And then he put cement on it. I want to show you the cement in verse, verse 51. Jesus says to him, this is the cement. Truly, truly. <laughs> this is just a double, this is a double emphatic statement. Truly, truly. Let's shake on it. You're going to see heaven open. You're going to see the angel of God descending, ascending, and descending. You're going to see them. You're going to see them ascending on the Son of Man. You're going to see powerful, supernatural things. You're going to bear witness. I am the Christ. I am the Savior. I am the Son of God. But I, like John the Baptist, am a servant of God. And we know later on he's letting them know after chapter 12 in the Gospel of John, he lets them know, I'm going to die, and I'm going to die for you. My death is redemptive, and I'm going to sacrificially lay my life down for you. All you that believe, I'm going to wash your sins away. And boy, by the time you get to chapter 2, you see that, that, that phrase again, and then the third day. Now, if you want to go tracing down days, great. But just think in terms of transition. And he's now headed to a wedding. It's an interesting thought. He's told him who he is. He has not hidden it. Don't let anybody tell you that Jesus never called himself God. No. He let them know exactly who he is. Why he was there what he's come to do, what he expects from the people that he encounters. He expects them to believe. He expects them to come. He expects them to abide with him, get in fellowship with him and one another. And then he is going to march off into the world. And he's asking you and I to march with him and to be an example, to be a representative, to speak the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. You may not be able to teach a Bible study. You may not be able to go into a theological debate and feel comfortable. But you can be an effective witness for Christ. You can share the gospel with anybody, anywhere, anytime. You can tell them that Jesus is the Son of God. God who became flesh and dwelt on this earth. And then voluntarily laid his life down to pay for the sins of humanity. You can tell them that. God bless your hearts today. God keep you. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for the privilege of worship. And I pray, Father, everyone here has come into your presence in our time of prayer, in our time of praise, in our time of preaching, that we have, dear Father, focused on you. I pray that that is true, whether it's those here in the auditorium or those who are at home or those who are in their cars watching um, on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube. Help everyone to gather this information, Lord, and to recognize our commitment is to you. Your goal is to transform each one of us into Christ's likeness and to send us into the world as your representative. I trust that that's the case. I thank you for the privilege, and I pray that someone today, someone would acknowledge 
Man, brother, that's what I need. I need to put my faith, I need to put my belief, my trust in Jesus Christ. And I would say to you, put it in him and him alone. And there is solid ground. Father, bless that person today. Release that person to faith today. Help them to declare it and shout it. And I pray, dear Lord, for their strength and their development. Watch over this church. Build us. Guide us. Lead us. Help us to be what you want to be right here in this community. And help this community to see us for who we are as people of God, who love God and love people, want to serve God through serving people. And I pray, dear Lord, that we would continue to have great success in that area. And bless you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless your hearts today. Is there anything else? Any other announcements? I want to remind you guys about um, the annual church meeting coming up uh, the last Sunday of this month. I believe that's on the 29th. We'll have it right after the service. Um, February the 24th uh, through the 26th, the uh, Family Life uh, Weekend to Remember conference uh, held in Houston um, to encourage families, encourage couples, build relationships. We have found that to be very effective uh, over the years. So put those things on your calendars now. We start to think about it. A lot of great things uh, are going on. Uh, <clears throat> we are making a lot of progress uh, in terms of um, re-going back over policies, developing um, areas, um, starting to uh, look at a lot of things. We're going to be asking for a lot of help uh, coming up here in 2023. We're going to be asking for people to volunteer time, uh, volunteer skills, um, knowledge, and experience to help us uh, develop in a number of areas. So please just be thinking about that. I would ask you to be prayerful. I would ask you to be available and be willing and maybe even a little sacrificial in that regard. So we're looking to the future with great anticipation. Um, keep the... Uh, um, things that we're dealing with uh, with the property in your prayers. Um, anybody who perhaps would like uh, an update, you know, can see me after church, and uh, we'll be glad to share with you uh, the latest of things that are going on. And uh, nothing else, let's stand together. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We have come for that reason. We give thanks because you loved us. You first saw us. You called us. You drew us out of the darkness into the marvelous light. Father, watch over every family today. There are those that are home that are sick. I want to lift up Mary, Lord. I pray for Mary and that uh, her laryngitis and uh, the flu bug, dear Lord, she would be just healed and delivered and the rest of those in the house. I pray, dear Father, for my daughter, Kiana, who's not been well and hit hard by the flu bug recently. Uh, for those that are traveling, those that um, are just serving in other capacities, be with each and every one, Father. Watch over us all and uh, keep us as we live and move and have our being. I ask your blessings. I trust you for them and everyone under the sound of my voice those in the auditorium, those online. And I ask in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. God keep you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, George.